Hi, this is Pastor Rick. Glad you're with me today. I know some of you are home and some of you are watching me live by video, but however you're seeing me, I'm really here. And I came with a word for you today, and I know that sometimes it can be difficult for you. Uh, you have an impression of how God speaks to you. Some of you say, if only when he's alive in the flesh can I hear from God. No, I believe the word of God is alive and powerful and able to touch you wherever you are. So let's pray together and let's get on with it, shall we? Father, I pray today in Jesus' name. Wherever people are watching, whether they be live, whether they be on video, whether they be in the building live, wherever they are, touch them today through this message. I believe that what we're going to share has the power to transform their lives and has the power to make the difference in their lives. In Jesus' name, and everyone say amen. Today, we're going to continue the series, Courageous Priorities. My intent is very simple. I want to show you how important priorities are in your life. You will never achieve certain things in your life if you don't have clear priorities. If you don't know what goes first and if you don't know what goes second, what is prior, what is important. The word priority in its root means to make sure something takes precedence. That is what goes first. It's the things in your life that you define as these are the absolutes. I will not change these. These are priorities. If you are a person who has a great conversation with God, and you come up with a list of changes you need to make, and you decide these changes, I'm going to plan for them and implement a plan. I'm going to build the resources I need to make sure I implement these changes. If you don't have priorities, all your conversations, all your changes, all your plans will never happen. You have to have the resources to do it, but even if you have the resources and you don't have plan, if you don't have a commitment, rather, to making sure that this goes first and not that, you will never succeed. I've seen people have a plan to go to school. They have, a, they have the money to go to school, but they don't make school a priority. Their friends are a priority, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, whatever is a priority, but not getting a personal education. Some of you have not made yourself a priority. You're not first. You're behind everybody and everything else, and so that's why you don't succeed. And this will never change in your life until you can establish priority. That's why I call it, excuse me, courageous priorities, where you have a courageous moment in your life when you say, this is my season to make a new set of goals and priorities. Now, let me begin with five questions that I said earlier in our last study that will help you identify your priorities. And these questions are very simple, but they can be helpful. Number one, what is your definition? How do you define things? When it comes to love, when it comes to life, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to family, how do you define things? Do you see things, uh, do you see marriage as a place to find someone to support you? You don't want to work. You know, I'm not against stay-at-home moms, by the way, so don't misunderstand that, or in some cases, stay-at-home dads. I'm simply saying if your, com- if your view of marriage is someone cares for me and I don't do anything for them, then that's an interesting view. If you define love that way, people who love you let you do whatever you want to do, say whatever you want to say to them, that's how you define love. What is your definition? Secondly, what are your values? What are, what are your non-negotiable life rules? Non-negotiable life rules. What are your non-negotiable life rules? The things you will not change. The things you value the most. If you really want to know what a person's priorities are, look at their values. Where a person's treasure is, that's where their heart will be. And it's really important to understand that's important. So if I want to know what your priorities are, I look at your definitions, the way you define things. I look at your, your values. And thirdly, I look at your goals. And that's what we'll talk about today. What are you trying to do? What are you working towards? It's really important to be clear that you can never establish priorities if you don't have clear goals. I'm trying to get here. And then fourthly, we'll talk about this more next week, you have to have a timetable. So what, are your time, what is your timetable? I used the illustration last week. I said, if you're trying to get from here, Savannah, Georgia, to Orlando, how much time do you need? Close to five hours. If that's true, can you walk there? The answer was no. You have to either fly, ride in a car. You can't even ride a bike. You have to make sure that you understand that the timetable requirements will demand that you leave at a certain time and use a certain mode of transportation. And then lastly, we'll talk about your results. What are your current results? That will help you determine if your past priorities have worked. Because sometimes you can look at your results and that will motivate you to establish new priorities. And oftentimes your priorities are established or created because of past results. And you don't want those results anymore. 
Now, in our study today, we're going to go to the book of Esther, and we're going to look at chapter 3. And our goal is to look at two people, basically. One we hinted at last week, the guy's name is Haman. And then we're going to look at a guy named Mordecai. And there's an interesting dialogue here. Uh, this is now the part of the chapter of the book where Esther is, has been made queen in place of Vashti, who was removed because she refused to dance before the king in front of her drunken friends, his drunken friends, rather. And so now you have this incredible moment where Esther, who is a Jew, and no one knows it, by the way, as a matter of fact, that's something that, that Mordecai, her father who adopted her once her mother and father died, he, he basically adopted her. And he basically told her, listen, don't tell everybody you're Jew. Just, you know, just don't do it. And we have this incredible woman who has risen to be the queen, and she was raised by a guy. I talked about that last week, how amazing it is that this guy was able to do it. And I said that sometimes you don't have the genders you want. Sometimes you don't have the genders. You don't have the dad. You don't have the brothers and sisters. But you've got what you have. You got what you got, if I can say it that way. You have a mom. You don't have a mom and a dad. You got a dad. You don't have a mom and a dad. You got a dad. That's what you got. And you, you have an uncle. You have a grandmother. And what's amazing is sometimes people raising children can feel like, well, I can't really do anything. I really can't make a difference. Well, you can. And Mordecai is an example of that. He raises Esther. Esther becomes the queen eventually because the king chooses her after uh, Vashti is no longer queen. And when he chooses her to be his wife, now there's this amazing thing that happens in chapter 3. A guy named Haman is going to get into strife with a Jew named Mordecai, who is, of course, Esther's adopted father. And he's really her cousin. That's what he really is. But he adopted her, raised her as his daughter. Well, in chapter 3, listen to this unfolding crisis that's going to happen. And what you're going to learn is you're going to see how priorities affect you. Haman is going to adopt some priorities that are unhealthy. He's going to fall into some traps like we all do. And he's going to begin to think some things are important that are not important. Listen to this conversation. It's incredible. It's in Esther chapter 3, verse 1. After these things, King Assyrius promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agathite, uh, and the Agat, rather, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princesses who were with him. And all the king's servants who were with the king's gate bowed and paid homage to, to Haman. So when Haman walked by, they'd all bow and pay homage. He wasn't asking them to worship him. This is important. That he just wanted respect. And to Haman, this was really, really important. Is there anything wrong with that? Not really, but watch what happens. For so the king had commanded concerning him. Please be clear, the king said, when Haman comes by, I want all you guys to show homage. And yeah, I've elevated him in authority. I want you to show him homage and respect when he passes by. But Mordecai, the Jew, who was the, quote, adopted father of of um, Esther, the queen, would not bow, would not pay homage. When Haman would walk by, he'd stand straight. Now, I want you to understand, this is a very, very um, frustrating moment. You'll see why. Look at verse 3. Then the king's servants who were with the king's gate said to Mordecai, why, why do you transgress the king's command? You know, the king told you to do this, Mordecai. Why don't you do it? Watch this, verse 4. And it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told him it to Haman. So when he wouldn't bow, Haman obviously didn't notice it. But the guys told Haman, hey, this guy is not bowing. When you pass by, he's not showing you respect. So I want you to notice how there's this effort on a daily basis to change Mordecai's mind, and nothing's working. So he said this, so they told Haman, to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. Now, understand, his reasoning for not bowing was because he was a Jew. Okay, so that means what? Well, did he think that maybe Haman was trying to get him to worship him? Well, yeah, he could have thought that, but that wasn't really it. Was he trying to be really moral and, 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 and respectful to God? Could be, but... It was not abnormal in the Bible for a person to show respect. As a matter of fact, I'll show you a verse in a minute. It says that. So what happened, the Bible said in verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage, Haman was filled with wrath. So Haman 
now pays attention. Before, he never noticed it. But when the guys told him, he didn't notice it and paid attention. And so he saw, oh, this guy won't bow, well, verse 6 of chapter 3. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai. He, did, he didn't want to lay hands on him for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, here's what Haman came up with. This is important now. Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Asurias, the people of Mordecai. Just because, just because he wouldn't bow, he now wants to kill everybody. That's an amazing extreme. Now, that's one thing to say, I'm going to kill this guy because he won't bow. It's one thing to do that, but he can't come to that conclusion. He wants to somehow, at least he, he won't come to that conclusion. He decides to kill everybody. Everybody. One more time. Everybody. Have you ever seen a person just goes to extremes? He just goes to this incredible extreme. It's really odd that a person would go to that extreme. We're talking about killing thousands and thousands of people. This is not just a small thing to kill all of the Jews. This is, this is mass murder on a large scale. Tens of thousands of people. Hundreds of thousands of people. Amazing. Now, what's interesting is the only long-term benefit to this issue is to gain respect. He wanted to show that he was strong. You ever been sidetracked like this? You ever had a foolish priority? You've had something that you just wanted to happen and you made too big of a deal out of it? Well, that's what he's done. And what's interesting is in chapter 3, verse 9, he goes to the king and he has this little thing he says to the king. He says, hey, king, you know, there's some people that really want to honor you. There's some people. And he's kind of trying to describe these people. doesn't name them as Jews. But he says, hey, you know, um, they, they're not listening to you, king, and, and we should do something about these people. Well, the king doesn't even ask him in chapter 3 who the people are. The king basically, you know, says, well, get rid of them all. You know, the king goes along with Haman, not knowing they were Jews. And not knowing they were Esther's people, not knowing they were Mordecai's people, but never even mentioned Mordecai's name to the king. But the king gives Haman unlimited authority. Now, I want you to notice this for a second. When you're a leader in charge and you're making big decisions, you need to know all the facts. The first mistake made here was, of course, I believe, by, by Mordecai not being willing to bow. That's what set all this in motion. Okay? This good guy who's a godly guy has a point of pride that gets in the way and causes a tremendous rainstorm of problems. Number two... The second mistake was the king. The king doesn't ask any questions. Well, Haman, who are these people? And exactly what did they do exactly? Well, bring some of them in here. Let me talk to them. None of the investigation. He doesn't ask for any verification at all. He basically just takes Haman's word, and he gives this incredible power to him to get rid of all these people. Doesn't even ask how many they are or nothing. Just allows it to happen. Leaders, listen carefully, leaders can be guilty of making decisions without all the facts, and not understanding the, the, the challenge downhill that we cause. So you change the policies on the job, but you have no clue how that affects everybody else's insurance, everybody else's life. And so in this moment, Haman now has this power, and he exercises that. He's going to kill all the Jews, and here's the odd thing about this. This is so amazing. In chapter 3, verse 9, there's a statement where he basically says to the king, hey, listen, king, you don't have to even pay for the destruction of all these people. I'll pay for it. And he says, I'll pay you 10 talents of silver or millions, literally what that was meant was millions of dollars. I will fund the slaughter of these people. He was a millionaire. This guy was rich. Think about it again. A rich guy who's mad who's willing to spend a lot of his fortune just to kill people because he's mad. Amazing. This is a guy whose perspective, even though he's got a whole lot going for him, he's got authority, he's been elevated, the king elevates him, he's got all this wealth, and he says, I'm willing to pay for all these people to be killed. Talk about distorted priorities. Think about that in the context of the sermon. Look at his goal. Here's a guy whose goals are out of sync. Sometimes in life, God wants to bless you, but your priorities or your goals are wrong. He has invested now all of his energy into killing all these people. Sad. The question is, have you ever done this? Have you ever been so distracted by some foolish goal in your life? Have you ever come to a point in your life 
where you didn't even care to think about what, what was going on. You just basically got lost in the woods. And, and I'll tell you, my friend, it's tragic. A tragic moment. So Haman's goal, his one priority, is to get somebody. Can I ask you a question? Is there somebody like that in your life? Is there, is there a person that's offended you, wronged you? He got him another wife now. He's got him another woman. And now I'm going to make his life miserable. I'm not going to get the kids without a fight. It's going to always be some big issue. She's wrong, and I'm not going to help her. I'm just going to let her, you know, I'm just going to whip her down all I can. Do you have, do you have a heart like Haman? A get your heart? A vengeful heart? Say anything mean you can. It's amazing. And, and it doesn't just stop with Haman hating, his, hating Mordecai. He now hates all of his people. He doesn't, I mean, why would you kill everybody? But he's lost his way. So watch with me where I think the Bible says that Mordecai, who started all this, was wrong for creating this environment. Now, Romans chapter three, thirteen, rather, verse 7 makes a statement that says, Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, <clears throat> excuse me, custom to whom custom, and fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. You see, Mordecai was probably wrong for not honoring him. I want to be clear about that. I don't think that was the right attitude. I mean, well, suppose, you know, he thought he was, he was trying to get him to worship him. Well, it was obvious he wasn't because everybody else understood he didn't think he was a god. He never said he was a god. He wasn't right. I want you to understand this. He wasn't right. Mordecai had issues. You may have a boss that has issues. You may have people in your life that have issues. But do you have the right to act that way? Is that, is that okay? Well, Haman, by the way, is now convinced that this guy is wrong. And so he does something that's even more extreme. So watch this. You got Mordecai, who's extreme. And you got Haman who's extreme, and all of this is just a big cultural clash, and it is a mess. So now what do you do? Well, let me jump way ahead in the book. Let me go all the way to the end. There are 10 chapters in this book, and I want to jump all the way to the end and make a point. At the end of this sad saga, 75,000 people died. At the end of this. They send out a message to all the provinces, and the, in the message, the message says, what I want you to do is I want you to kill all the Jews. Now listen to this. This is chapter 3, verse 12. Then the king's scribes were called to the 13th day of the first month, and a decree was written according to the, all that Haman commanded to the king's satraps and to the governors who were uh, over every, each, I'm sorry, province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to its script, and to, to every people in their language. In the name of King Assurius, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letter was sent by the couriers into all the country's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day. Kill all of them in one day. This is all because a man wouldn't bow. Wow. Wow. I want you to, and then plunder their possessions. So a copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people that they should read and be ready for that day. Now, please think about this. This was sent to 127 provinces, all the way from India to Ethiopia. This is widespread all of Israel, all of everywhere. And so now, what is now Israel, rather, at least. So it's, it's sent all over the place. And so now, how do you turn this around? How do you, how do you, how do you fix this? When you send this kind of thing out, right, to 127 provinces, you, you know, there's no email, there's no email blast, there's no phone calls. You know, you had to send a guy on a horse, right? And he had to read it and post it and pass out little handwritten copies. There's no copy machines, right? So there's once you say it, you can't fix it. So once they said it, at the end of the day, it was already done. 
you couldn't turn it around. So now all the Jews are told in one year it's going to be destruction for everybody. He says, annihilate them in the month of Adar or March. And to plunder them on the 13th day of the 12th month, last month of the year. 12th month, I want you on the 13th day of the last month in March. Plunder their possessions, kill them all in one day. Imagine what it's like waiting to die. Imagine what it's like to have people riding by your house saying on the, on, on the, in the month of March, the 13th day of March, I'm going to come back here and kill all of you. On the 13th day of March, your house is going to be my house. On the 13th day of March, there's no, there's no, there's no redemption. So now, now, now notice what happened. All this happens because of his rage. One man's rage, Haman's rage. Haman's rage has now infected 127 provinces. Haman's rage has caused the whole community to turn toward the Jews with hatred. Haman's rage has caused the Jews to panic. They panicked for one year, afraid that they were going to all be killed. The story in chapter 3 of Esther, verse 12 through 14, that I just read to you is profound. Because in those verses you see the amazing decision that one guy made. So here is a question for you. Hmm. Have you created an environment in your family because of your rage, because of your justified anger in your opinion, and maybe you are, that is now out of control? You can't, re you can't get the children to respect their father because you told said so much about him. You can't get them to respect their mother because you said so much about her. I mean, it's just out of control. Is that what you've done? Maybe that's, that's really a tragedy. And was that your goal? So I want you to notice something. Because Haman's goals were wrong, it made his priorities wrong. If you are so mad and your goal is to get back at your ex or you get back at whoever or to punish somebody, if you're not careful, if you let that goal shape your priorities, you can destroy everything in your future. Well, here's what happened. Because this happens, now, next week I'm going to tell you how it was all turned around because it was all turned around at a party. Haman had a plan to kill all the Jews, and he had this amazing plan for Mordecai in particular. He was going to hang him on a noose. He had his whole gallows built for him. But before I tell that, let me just jump to the end of the story because I just think this is important to say. It's important for you to understand that in the end, if this plan doesn't work, in the end, Haman ends up in trouble himself. But, but that, again, we'll talk about next week. But I want you to think about this for a second. I want you to see how one person's goals that are out of sync affects everybody. Everybody is going to be hurt and damaged because of one person's goals. I've seen this in churches. I've seen this with companies. I've seen this in families where the dad's goal is to lead and be in charge. He, that's the only thing that matters. Everybody bows to him when he comes home. Everybody answers him when he says something. Everybody's responsive to him. That's the goal. So that then shapes the priorities. And so the only value that they have is, you do what I say when I say it. I don't care what you think. I'm in charge. So that's the goal, you see. That becomes the priority. And the values are established based on that. And so everyone around you is kind of like a slave or a servant because you pay the bills, because you're in charge. And so your company, your employees all feel this tension, those you supervise, because the goal is for you to listen to me. When you think that way and you live that way, what you end up with is distorted priorities that hurt people. And here's what you do, and this is the last point for today. You force people to defend themselves. You force people to play defense and many times offense. Haman's response to this, Haman's attitude, is now going to force Mordecai to go to Esther, and they have to come up with a plan. Do people have to come with a plan to deal with you? Is it like, okay, we got to have a meeting because dad's out of control. And because dad's out of control, 
we have to defend ourselves. It's really tragic that a person has to leave you because they can't feel safe. Because if they stay with you, there's a chance that they won't be okay. They can't stay in the church because if they stay in the church, the church is going to ask for too much money, too much time. It's going to be too demanding. The pastor's going to be all up in my life and business. I won't have any privacy. If I, if I stay in this church, I have to backslide just to have a life. If you're not careful, that's what happens. And so it becomes this horribly difficult thing when a person says, okay, I have to defend myself now. That's what Haman created. He could have just went and talked to Mordecai, but he didn't. So they defend themselves. And again, I'm jumping to the end of the story. I'll fill in one last piece next week, but I want to show you something that's important because I want you to see how because his goals were wrong, because he made the priority of all life vowing to him, now the Bible says, Look at chapter 9, verse 16. The remainder of the Jews in the king's province gathered together and protected them, their lives. The remainder of the Jews had to gather themselves together. And on the day, when that day came, on March 13th, the 12th month, even though in our study we're going to see next week, the king rescinded it. The king, when the king found out, the king rescinded it. The king said, no, you guys can't kill all the Jews. And in the end, Haman lost, but I want, you to, I want you to think with me for a second. Some things can't be quickly turned around. So once the king found out, all this was thrown out, but it didn't matter because you couldn't send enough guys and enough horses to enough places to fix everything. That's why you need to be careful what you say when you're mad. Because sometimes you can really be sorry, but you can't fix that. Those people in that grocery store that you told off don't ever want to see you again. That person at the car wash that you cussed out because they didn't say what you wanted them to say when you were getting your car washed, they don't ever want to go to your church. Again, ever. Haman created, set something in motion that couldn't be turned around. That's why some of us need to pause in our anger, pause in these moments because you can, listen to me, you can convince a person. You can, you can create a situation where people have to defend themselves to survive. And that's what happened here. Speeding to the end of the story in chapter 9 of Esther, verse 16. The remainder of the Jews in the king's province gathered together and protected their lives, had rest from their enemies. And listen to me, they, had, they killed 75,000 of their enemies. 75,000 people still attacked them throughout all those countries. Even though the king rescinded it, 75,000 people didn't get the message. So the Jews had to fight and defend themselves. It's, a, it's an incredible story. And, and I, I, sometimes I just think to myself, what am I setting in motion that I can't fix? What am I doing? What, are my priorities so far off that somehow I'm, I'm not even aware that I've created a damage that can't be fixed? Sometimes your goals are off. What are your priorities? What are your goals? And how much time do you have to fix them? There was a time slot in there before the letters went out, before the horsemen went out to fix it. There was a timetable when Haman could have came to himself and said, hey, hey, come to himself rather than said, hey, you know, this is, um, this is not right. I shouldn't kill all these people, thousands of people, because you won't bow. Come here. Tell me your story. Everybody's bowing to me. Why aren't you bowing? He could have done that. Or Mordecai could have simply just bowed. Two guys fighting, and now they've created this incredible problem. Is your pride in the way? I'm just wondering. Is your pride in the way of it getting better? Okay, so... You're about to wreck your home, wreck your children, wreck everything you work to build for what? Just curious. Mordecai messed up, I believe. But the greatest one was Haman because he was the leader. Mordecai didn't have any titles. 
Mordecai is just a guy who helped the girl survive a crisis. He helped Esther. Mordecai is not a spiritual hero. He's not. He's not praised or admired in any great way in the, in the story of Esther. The issue is Haman was a leader. He should have known better. He was promoted by the king to, because obviously he had some gifts. He didn't become a millionaire by accident. I mean, so the, the question is, okay, if you're accomplished, right, you've worked hard, right, why lose it over this? Why, why, why set in motion this tornado in your family and in your life for this? Tell me get that, please. But Haman never repented. Even when he gets, and we get into his story next week, and I want to show you what happens when you don't pay attention to the timetable. You see, Haman just didn't get it. He never got it. And the question is, are you going to be one of those people? But I'll leave you with this final thought. You don't have forever. Haman didn't have forever. You don't have forever. Mordecai didn't have forever. You don't have forever to change. You don't have forever to fix it. Well, you say, well, pastor, is this meant to be a heavy message? No, no, not at all. It's, not, it's meant to be a message to get you to think. It, 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 are my goals right? Are, are, are these goals the, the things that I need to put my whole life into? Haman's whole life became about one thing, killing every Jew there was. That was his whole goal. Is that, is that a healthy goal for you? Get your husband back or get somebody back you're mad with or to punish somebody? What's your goals? I think we have to be careful as a church about establishing our goals. We have to be careful when we make a priority. We have to be careful that we don't get off. Because here is what I want you to hear. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. You don't have forever. And if you don't adjust this, you might wait too late. And it might be too late to fix it. So why don't you pray with me today? And let's start today establishing some better goals that will get you where you want to be. If, if Haman wanted respect, there are other ways to get it than killing everybody. If you want respect, there's other ways to get it than sabotaging your family wrecking your life, fighting, hurting, and maiming people. There are better ways to get there. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that in the midst of this moment that somebody would say, okay, I've got the wrong goals, and I need to realign these goals. I need to rethink this. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that where there's been strife and tension, there'd be healing and deliverance. We don't have forever, and next week we'll talk about the importance of timetables. And we'll talk about how much time we have, and we'll talk about how our results can be different if we, have, if we respond now. The, Bible, the moment we hear your voice, we need to respond then, right now. And so in Jesus' name, I speak your word over the lives of your people, and I declare that they will respond today and set new goals and be open to new timetables respecting, Lord God, your hand on their life. And may we learn from these stories that you gave us. And may we learn to be forgiving and loving in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, an elder is going to come now and pray for you. For some of you, you need to release some anger. For some of you, you need to release an issue. For some of you, you have been offended. You were done wrong, but you've been too angry. So they're going to come pray for you in that area and then ask you an important question about your walk with Jesus. And so let this be the beginning of a new walk for you. Set new goals, set new priorities, so you can receive all God has for you. The elder's going to come and pray with you right now. To your feet. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you care for me. such a special way That's why I pray I lift you up And I magnify your name That's why My heart is filled with praise My heart is filled with praise
everyone to bow your heads for a moment. For some of you, in order for you to release the goal, to reach the goals that God has in store for you, there are certain things you're going to have to release in your life, in your mind, in your spirit. For some of you, you've been just carrying anger, anger, just like Haman carried anger. And there's a domino effect. There's things happening in your life, in your family, on your job, in your finances. All sorts of things are happening, almost like falling like dominoes because you're just holding on to this anger. We're going to do a few things on today where in the name of Jesus, we're going to release things that could be a hindrance to the goals that, that God has in store for you. So if you are holding anger for whatever reason, I want you to raise your hand as a symbol of release and put it back down. If you've been holding anger, lift your hand up as a sign of release and put it back down. If you're holding heartbreak and you need to release it, I want you to lift your hand as a sign of release and put it back down for heartbreak. For some, it may be depression. If you're experiencing depression, I want you to lift your hand up as a sign of release and put it back down. For some, it's pride, just like Haman. And even a, a sense of pride by, from Mordecai has caused this domino effect. If you need to release pride, lift your hand up as a sign of release and put it back down. For some, it's disappointment. Tremendous disappointment. I want you to lift your hand up as a sign of release and put it back down. And for some, you're just offended. Someone hurt your feelings, you're bothered, you're carrying it, you can't even hardly look at the person, you can't hardly even function because of being offended. I want you to lift your hand up as a sign of release and put it back down. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word today. And we don't want anything in our lives that can hinder your blessings for us. Whatever it is, Lord God, whether it was anger, heartbreak, depression, whatever it is, we release it right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, everyone, lift your hands and say, I release it now in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to get our priorities in order to move forward so that the goals that we have in life and even the goals you have for us can be reached. And we thank you, Lord God. I love you. I love, I love you. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Because you care for me. Because you care for me in such a special way.
if you can bow your heads one more time and all hands down. The greatest thing you could possibly ever release in life is your life. For some of you, you've never made a commitment to Christ and said, Jesus Christ, I want you to come into my heart, be ruler of my life. For some, you've been trying to lead your own life and following your own manual, and it is not working. Jesus is waiting, saying, all you have to do is come to me. You can be a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And God made it so easy. He said, all you have to do is confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. You are brand new. You have a new beginning. He made it easy. So if there's anyone who wants today to release your life and say, I want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And we're not going to pull you up, take you into any room. We will pray with you from your seat. So if you want that prayer of salvation, you want to release your life to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I want you to lift your hand up and put it back down. Hallelujah. All you have to do is lift your hand up as a sign of release and put it back down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more time, lift your hand up as a sign of release and put it back down. Everyone repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before your throne in the name of Jesus. For your word says, if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I will be saved. Say, on today, I confess. On today, I believe. And today, I receive. Forgive me of all my sins. And make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those who lifted their hands and surrendered their lives to you. I pray, Lord God, that you would strengthen them and encourage them as they just trust in you for their daily walk. I pray, Lord God, that they understand that even as they leave these doors, the enemy's job is to snatch the word of God out of their life. But there is nothing that they can do, no perfection, no life of perfection that caused them to be saved. That they are saved only because they chose to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they stood before your throne and asked for forgiveness, and that is salvation. So I pray, Lord God, they rest in that fact that they will feed themselves on a regular basis and grow stronger and stronger in you. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. That's why... That's why heart is filled with praise. That's why, that's why my heart is filled with praise. According to the word of God, the angels in heaven are rejoicing because of those people who pray today. So let's rejoice also. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated.